Lemmy didn't just raise the volume, he made it beg for mercy. He was as real as the scars on his leather jacket. Lemmy never backed down, never even knew where the brakes were, nor did he care. Most importantly, Lemmy never gave a damn about what anybody thought. Like, subscribe, thank you. Ian Lemmy Kilmister was born on Christmas Eve, 1945 in Burslem, a town in Stoke-on-Trent, England. His early life was tough, but he was resilient. Lemmy's dad, a former RAF chaplain, ditched the family when Lemmy was only three months old, leaving his mom to raise him solo. This made him pretty independent from a young age, maybe even contributing to his lifelong dislike of authority figures. So when Lemmy turned 10, his mom got married to an ex-footballer, George Willis, and they all moved to a farm in the sleepy village called Benlick in North Wales. He grew up in a rural area, a far cry from the industrial city where he was born. Lemmy, stuck on the farm, found peace in music and horses. He got hooked on the guitar after seeing a friend play and just decided to teach himself. Lemmy was the only English student as Sir Thomas Jones's school in Omwick, which made him stick out like a sore thumb. And he was also a bit of a rebel. He got the name Lemmy back then. Nobody's really sure why. Some think his nickname came from him always asking to borrow a pound, saying Lemmy a quid, while others just think it was a weird nickname that caught on. During his teenage years, Lemmy totally got into the rock and roll scene that was taking off loving the wild energy of musicians like Little Richard and Elvis Presley. And their music, full of rebellion and raw passion, really got to him. Little Richard especially became a hero for life. Lemmy really dug his wild style, seeing him as a real deal when it came to rock and roll. He liked the fact that Little Richard was just unapologetic, loud, and damn dangerous for the time. Lemmy ditched school at 15, desperate to leave Wales behind, and bounced around doing odd jobs while he practiced his music. During this time, he played guitar in bands like the Sundowners and the Rainmakers, gigging at small clubs and youth centers. Those early gigs were rough, but they gave Lemmy the experience he needed to make him even more determined to make music in his life. It's all a game to me. And so in 1963, Lemmy decided to head to Stockport near Manchester, hoping for better chances. And there, he joined the Motown Sect, a band that covered American R&B hits. Now, this band wasn't actually related to the Detroit record label that became famous. They ended up touring around northern England, playing gigs in clubs and pubs. And it was those early days where Lemmy started to figure out how to work a crowd, and he earned a reputation for being a damn good showman. In 1965, Lemmy made the move to London, right in the middle of all the British music action. And there, he was in a band called the Rockin' Vickers for a short time. And this group was known for their crazy stage shows and outlandish outfits. Lemmy recorded three singles with the band, and they toured Europe, even playing in Yugoslavia, one of the first British rock groups to even do so. The Rockin' Vickers didn't exactly blow up, but the whole thing opened Lemmy's eyes, and he was all in on music after that. But soon, Lemmy would get a pretty wild gig. He ended up becoming a roadie for Jimi Hendrix. He had run into Noel Redding, Hendrix's bass player, at a London club and quickly became part of their close-knit group. So he basically run the backstage, getting the gear ready, sorting out the guitars and making sure everything went off without a hitch. And Lemmy was blown away by Hendrix how he could totally nail those crowds and push the limits of music. Lemmy said he learned more from Hendrix in a single week than he could have on his own in years. And it was also during this time that Lemmy got a taste of the wild rock and roll lifestyle. The parties were crazy, drugs were everywhere, and the energy was electric. And of course, Lemmy loved it all. And so in 1971, Lemmy tried out for Hawkwind, this space rock band, as a bass player. He grabbed a bass for the audition, and like the legend he was, charmed everybody, with his rough playing and stage presence. Hawkwind became well known for their trippy music and wild live gigs full of lights and stage theatrics. But Lemmy's contributions gave the music a rougher, tougher sound. He quickly became a key player in this group, contributing to some of Hawkwind's biggest hits. Lemmy wrote and sang on Silver Machine in 1972, which became a surprise hit, making it all the way to number three in the UK charts. And while playing for Hawkwind, Lemmy's bass sound also became pretty recognizable. He used the Rickenbacker 4001 bass, sound was bright and forceful, perfect for standing out in Hawkwind's wild music. He'd also run into a martial amp, cranked up loud to get that aggressive sound that everybody would eventually come to know him for. And Lemmy generally liked to keep things simple. He mostly avoided adding extra layers of sound, letting the raw energy of the live performances shine through in the recording. He would use a lot of strong downstrokes to get a sharp, almost angry sound. A recording Silver Machine turned out to be a big deal for Lemmy. Dave Brock, 
Hawkwind's guitarist and leader, produced the song and saw Lemmy's star quality as the frontman. And it was a bit unusual to have Lemmy sing on the tracks if Hawkwind usually had Brock or somebody else handling the lead vocals. But the performance was powerful, charismatic, and perfectly captured the song's rebellious vibe. Lemmy said that they were looking for something that would be out of this world but still rooted in rock and roll. Lemmy, not wanting to get into any kind of 9 to 5 jobs, really found his groove with Hawkwind. And the reason for this is because they're all about intense touring and trippy music. But things started getting tense within the band. While the other guys were all dropping acid, Lemmy was all about the speed. They were also getting into a lot of clashes about what to do musically. In 1975, Lemmy got busted at the Canadian border while on tour in North America. They thought he had coke, but it turned out to be amphetamines. And he ended up in jail for five days, but ended up walking free without charges because of a legal loophole. But the whole thing messed up his already shaky relationship with the band, and he got the boot not long after. Lemmy would go on to say that they had actually done him a favor. So it wasn't long after he got the boot from Hawkwind that Lemmy started Motorhead, and in his words, it was the best thing that ever happened to him. Lemmy wanted to start a band that would be his idea of rock and roll. Loud, fast, and totally raw. He originally wanted to call the band Bastard, but was quickly advised that that name might keep them off of TV. And says Lemmy was a speed freak, he was already calling himself Motorhead anyway, so sit. Motorhead's early days were pretty rough. The band's first lineup featured guitarist Larry Wallace and drummer Lucas Fox. Their early stuff got shot down by the label. Frustrated with the way things were going, Lenny brought in a lineup change, and he brought in Fast Eddie Clark on guitar and Phil Filthy Animal Taylor on the drums. And that's how the classic Motorhead lineup came together. So when they decided to cut their first album, they brought in Vic Mail, who had worked with Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix, and he'd be able to give this a polished sound, but without losing the raw edge of Motorhead. Making that first record was a real grind, with the band putting in long hours to make sure every track was perfect. Lemmy's bass was the engine that drove songs like Motorhead and Iron Horse, Born to Lose. But right from the get-go, Motorhead's sound, a mix of aggressive energy and pinpoint accuracy, defined their album and cemented their position in rock history. The song Motorhead, which is also the band's name, kicks the album off with a ferocious energy that's instantly recognizable. Lemmy's bass lines, recorded at a tight, fast pace, weave in and out of Clark's wild guitar riffs, while Iron Horse, Born to Lose, kind of showed a mix of the heavier rock with the raw energy of punk. Motorhead also took the classic song Louie Louie by the Kingsmen and gave it a much heavier, distorted sound. Lemmy's raspy voice and the band's tight playing made the song fresh and powerful. And Motorhead, when they would go into the studio, just liked to keep it real. They wanted to capture the raw energy of their live shows, so the recording methods pretty much reflected them all playing together at one time. While other bands and producers would obsess over every single technical detail in the recording, Motorhead just wanted to make sure it was loud and raw. You don't in, the in 1979, Motorhead dropped two albums, Overkill and Bomber, which totally put them on the map. What's interesting about Overkill was when they introduced the use of double bass drums, especially on the title track, which at the time really pushed how fast and intense rock music could be. Overkill was recorded at Roundhouse Studios in London with Jimmy Miller at the helm, and he's the guy behind some of Rolling Stone's best songs. And with this album, they still managed to capture that raw energy that the band had, but it was much smoother and more polished sounding. Lemmy's bass really stuck out on this album as well. And the drum sound on Overkill was a big step forward in those days. Phil Taylor's double bass drumming let the band get really intricate with the rhythms, going way faster and more complex, still keeping the heavy sound that they were known for. And together, Lemmy and Taylor made a hell of a rhythm section that totally defined the sound. Add Fast Eddie Clark in there and his ripping through a speed that at the time was pretty damn groundbreaking. And this one became an instant hit. It starts off with Overkill, and right away those double bass drums are just popping the listener right in the head. And then it builds up with that distorted bass, and then it is on. This was prototypical metal at its best. And it's pretty obvious that a lot of this music that Motorhead was doing would shape a lot of the 80s metal that we've come to know. Loud, fast, aggressive, and powerful. Fast Eddie's guitar playing just hit hard, ripping out some wah-drenched solos. And especially on the first song, Overkill, sounds a lot like what Kirk Hammett would end up doing years later. So no doubt it probably had a serious influence on him as well. And this album also really shows just how well bass and overdrive or distortion work well together. Stay Clean is some straight-up heavy rocking. 
And for this one, Lemmy actually layered his vocals, which gave his rasp a really cool sound during the verses. The middle section shows him just ripping up on the bass, going into full solo mode. Then Fast Eddie Clark picks it up at the end, and all in all, it is a nice, intense track. Another real standout is their take on Louie Louie, which was really done by the Kingsmen, that took it into a really heavy punk rock direction. Still got that happy vibe, but a whole hell of a lot more power. You could tell the band just had a blast doing this one. For the next album, released the same year, they're pushing more in that metal envelope. Songs like Dead Men Tell No Tales is brimming with fast-paced intensity. It's hard-driving rock and roll, but with an edge. And for this album, the sound was a little bit cleaner and more focused than on Overkill. The bass was a little bit less pronounced here and there, but the panning of the guitars was really cool where they'd have Fast Eddie's doubled lines panned hard left and hard right, and then sometimes just smacked up in the middle for that extra punch during some solos. And for this one, they had brought Vic back in, who had produced their very first album. He just had a certain level of rawness in his production style that totally complemented the way Motorhead liked to approach things. The song Sharpshooter is an all-out headbanger with some really catchy riffs. Lemmy's menacing vocal rounds it out perfectly. Another standout that actually didn't make the album, but it was an outtake from the sessions, is the song Treat Me Nice, which is just a down and dirty blues, but with Motorhead's signature all over it. It's a shame that they had kept it off the album, because it would have definitely become an instant favorite. Another song they left off the album, which would also have been a great addition, was Fun on the Farm, which had much more of a fast punk vibe to it but a lot of really cool orchestration with the guitars. And that one is a full-on instrumental, and they go through all sorts of really cool changes throughout, and it really shows off fast Eddie's chops. So when the band started touring behind the Bomber album, they started pushing their live shows to new heights, showcasing the unique stage presence of the band. And they made it pretty darn theatrical, complete with a 40-foot lighting rig that was shaped like a bomber plane. This became a real immersive experience for the fans. And by this time, Motorhead's shows were loud as hell, with the band going full-on, leaving fans blown away and cementing their reputation as one of rock's toughest live acts. And then in 1980, Motorhead would drop their tour de force, Ace of Spades, and this became their most famous album. Kicking right off with the title track, Ace of Spades, it's just an absolute smack in the forehead. Lemmy's just absolutely belting it to the microphone. That aggressive, distorted bass panned right up hard in the center. Lyrically, it's a really interesting song. It touches on Wild Bill Hickok's hand as he was taken down during a game of poker in 1876. And it was Aces and Eights, which of course contained the Ace of Spades. And it was funny because Lemmy would grow sick of the song after a while because it was just their biggest hit, full of all sorts of gambling cliches. He said that he had sang it for two years and nobody had even noticed. And Lemmy ended up getting a tattoo of the Ace of Spades on his left forearm. And after he had passed away, Dave Grohl would end up getting an Ace of Spades tattoo on his wrist as well. And even though Lemmy was into slot machines at the time, he thought writing a hard, heavy song about spinning fruit probably wouldn't fit so well. So he took more of the poker route lyrically. But interestingly, the album's production was probably a bit less polished than Bomber was. A lot more raw and in your face. Vic Ma was again at the helm for this one, and the band really liked working with him. They even gave him a nickname, Turtle, saying that he had resembled a turtle, so apparently he never lived it down. And of course, since the band were a wild and rowdy bunch, he was kind of that calm voice that balanced them out perfectly. But the band was hard and heavy all throughout. Songs like Live to Win were just all out headbangers, fast, aggressive, and raunchy as all hell. Just an album that burns from start to finish. You could pretty much crank it, set it, and forget it, and just let it rip. And this one actually hit number four on the UK albums chart, and it went gold by March of 1981. It was also the band's first release in the US, and it is considered by many to be one of the best hard rock albums of all time. So now that their latest album, Ace of Spades, blew up, they hit the road hard, playing tons of shows at huge venues and festivals all over Europe and North America. And the tour really showed off how much energy and dedication the band had for giving their fans a killer live show. Lemmy had totally honed his stage act, and we keep the crowd entertained with a mix of humor, 
defiance, and charm, reflecting the latest album's rebellious vibe, and fans just could not get enough. Lemmy, wanting to keep up with the demands of the live shows, ended up upgrading his gear setup. He switched over to Ampeg SVT bass amps, known for being seriously loud and super reliable. And he also started introducing an MXR bass chorus pedal to give his bass lines that little extra punch during the live shows. While Motorhead was a group that was really ushering in a lot of what we would end up hearing in thrash metal, Lemmy was never about the genre. He just saw it all as pretty much loud, rebellious music. He would say at the time, we're just a rock and roll band, that's it. But Motorhead's fan base became extremely dedicated. Lemmy was always taken aback by how they would tattoo Motorhead all over themselves. The Warpig logo with his mean looking face full of teeth and all the spikes and chains really caught on with the fans. Or they get tattoos of Lemmy, either his face or lyrics from songs like Ace of Spades or Iron Horse, Born to Lose. He said it was pretty wild seeing people with his face inked on their bodies. And of course, a total honor. And since there were no 360 deals back in the day, the band was able to make a huge chunk of their living selling merch. And he always gave back. Lemmy would spend a lot of time just hanging out with his fans, chilling out with them after concerts. And he had said our fans are the most loyal in the world. They stick with it, even when something new pops up. The Grateful Dead may have had dead heads, but Motorhead definitely had Motorhead heads, without a doubt. With the actual official name being the Motorhead Army who would stick with the band no matter what was hot because they really loved the fact that Lemmy was just the real deal. He was all about living life to the fullest, and he was also about the wild side of rock and roll. And of course, Lemmy liked his speed as well as Jack and Coke, and he put away a bottle a day, but he always managed to keep everything together, never letting it wreck his work or his life. He would often joke, I never had a problem with drugs, just cops. He also wasn't into sexist crap either. He was a real staunch defender of women in rock. If someone said a female musician was pretty good for a girl, Lemmy would shoot back, well, she's better than you, mate. Lemmy would say, if a woman could play, she can play. It's all the same, dude. For the next album, Iron Fist, this would show the last of the three Amigos lineup. Fast Eddie Clark, Phil Taylor, and Lemmy together as a unit. They had come out with their live album, No Sleep Till Hammersmiths, which was actually number one on the UK charts. So they're riding high on a lot of successes. But with this one, the group would also end up parting ways with Vic Mile. One story has it that Fast Eddie did not want to work with him and that he wanted the band to actually produce it. But Fast Eddie Clark had said that it was actually Phil Taylor who did not want to work with him because he wasn't liking the drum sound that he was getting. So Taylor then turned to Eddie and said, hey, why don't you produce it? And he was like, I don't want to do it. I'm playing on the record. Overall, though, Lemmy was not a fan of the end result. He had said that he was pissed off and he called most of it garbage. He just saw it as cobbled together. But often the bands themselves are their own worst critic because the album is just as heavy and raw as their previous efforts. It fits perfectly. Songs like the title track, Iron Fist, is just fast, furious, and heavy as all hell. Another standout track is Go to Hell. It's quintessential Motorhead, pure in-your-face, moderately paced, and hard-rocking, with some cool melodic guitar harmonies during the rhythms, and they never lost the essence of Lemmy's bass sound, where you could hear it churning just right in the middle. Eddie managed to get a great drum sound for the album as well, but again, not much different than their previous album. Taking Speed Freak, for example, that bass intro just sounds wicked and intense, and it's one of the more frenetic songs with Lemmy just screaming over the top. And of course, it's about Lemmy's favorite pastime, getting all sped up. Fast Eddie's solo on this one is completely ripping. And they go through some chord changes in the solo, which have it shifting gears all the way through. But the pentatonic licks on this are solid. One of the coolest riffs on the album is to bang two rights. And on this one, the production was really clean, or at least relatively clean. The band is still raw, but it really sits nicely in the speakers. It also has some really cool chord changes in it. But even though Eddie was pulling double duty, this entire album was some of his best guitar work with the band. Just pure high octane rock and roll all the way through. Lemmy also started playing around with basses during this time. He brought in the Gibson Thunderbird, which gave it more of a richer, thicker sound. And through the overdrive, it just pulsates through the speaker. So when the band was touring behind it, they only got in a couple dates and fast eddie clark just said this is enough tensions had been brewing between lemmy and fast eddie but really came to a head as they were about to record stand by your man which is a cover of a tammy wynette song and they're gonna have wendy o williams and the plasmatics as part of it that was kind of the final straw 
even though according to Lemmy, Eddie had actually dropped out of the band a few times, but they'd always persuade him to come back. Lemmy had said that Eddie was drinking a lot back then, and they were just getting tired of him. Nevertheless, they managed to get the Stand By Your Man cover recorded, and musically it's probably more raw than anything they had done in a while. The recording is rough around the edges, but it really has that punk feel. Lemmy and Wendy O. Williams play off of each other perfectly vocally, both screaming at the top of their lungs. Melodically, it's kind of interesting because obviously the chorus has such a happy feel, so juxtaposed against the heavy hard rock punk vibes. It's a strange track, but it definitely qualifies as a true punk anthem. So this made it onto the Stand By Your Man EP, which was released in 82. The straw that broke Fast Eddie's back and he had just had to get out of the band. And they had a hell of a time for the session. According to Lemmy, Wendy had a hard time getting in tune. The parts that she was trying to do just did not sound good at all. Eddie was originally working as producer on this one, not even playing guitar. So you had Wendy's guitarist from the Plasmatics playing guitar, Lemmy on bass, Phil Taylor on the drums. Eddie ended up bringing in Will Reed Dick to produce, but they were having such a hard time getting things working in the studio. Eddie was off sulking with Evil Red, as Dick was called. And Lemmy said, had that guy not have been there, they probably could have gotten through all the problems. But the thing is, the tension was building up for a while. Fast Eddie Clark would then go on to form Fastway, which is a great early 80s metal band, really more hard rock, that produced two great albums, and he would end up sobering up and making up with Lemmy, thankfully. So nevertheless, they ended up bringing in Brian Robertson, who had been in Thin Lizzy, to take Eddie's place. They got together for the 1983 album Another Perfect Day, which really was a departure for the group. They were kind of going more for catchy melodies, but songs like Back at the Funny Farm show the band in full swing with this new lineup. <laughs> Brian is a real shredder, so guitar-wise, he brought a whole new dynamic to the group. Eddie sure could rip it up, but Brian definitely had a lot more technique, and it showed immediately. Take a song like One Track Mind, for example, and it was starting to show production that fit the day, a little less raw and rough around the edge, and Lemmy was going for more melodic vocal lines. A lot of fans weren't really liking this new direction that they were going, but of course they had a loyal, dedicated fan base, so... They would still get behind the band, but it still was not one of their best performing albums by a mile. Not to say that it's not a great album. There are some serious burners on here, including Back to the Funny Farm, I Got Mine, Die You Bastard was one of the sassest ones to date at that point. But there was a lot more going on melodically with Lemmy's voice especially. He was trying some new things, and it just lost its raw vibe in a lot of ways. Still though, some serious hard rocking throughout. Another standout track is Rocket, which ironically had some piano on it, but that didn't take away from its heaviness and the aggressive groove. This is more like classic Motorhead, but a bit more well-produced and polished, and it also has some interesting changes before heading into the chorus, which makes it musically a bit of a departure, but it definitely qualifies as another scorcher on the album. But it wouldn't be long before Lemmy really got tired of Ryan Roberts. For one thing, he dressed differently than the rest of the band. Lemmy had said that the recording sessions for Another Perfect Day were just pure torture. A lot of that hinged on the fact that Brian would take a really long time to get the perfect guitar take. Not to mention that after all those grueling recording sessions, the album would end up not performing as well. And Lemmy did actually like the album, but he just saw it as a whole slide downwards for the band after getting Robo or Brian Robertson in. But then after this album, they would actually have to go through yet another lineup, both with Taylor leaving the group as well as Rock. And Robertson and Taylor would go on to form a band called Operator. So now it was basically Lemmy solo. And so Lemmy went and put together a brand new lineup. Only this time now he had two guitar players, Phil Wizzo Campbell and Michael Wurzel Burston. Both came through a round of auditions that Lemmy was holding for a guitar player, and they were really the two final choices. So instead of having to pick between one or the other, he just went ahead and went with both of them. And the two actually played together really well, so it worked out. Motorhead had switched labels by this time too, because they had a fallout with the label that they had been working with, which is Bronze Records. And so they had actually kept touring, even though they weren't supporting a label. And all the labels had passed on them that were pretty current for what they were doing. MCA, Elektra, 
Epic, CBS, Chrysalis, they sold a hell of a lot more t-shirts than they did album. But Motorhead ended up winning a lawsuit against the old label. And so with those proceeds, they ended up forming their own label, Great Western Road, or GWR. And it was actually a joint venture. Their manager, Douglas Smith, was also a part of it. Their other manager, Dave Simmons, was also a part of it. And he had actually bought the band out of the contract with Bronze. And then there was Ray Richards, who owned a label called Legacy, who had bought out the entire Bronze label catalog. So there were actually a lot of players here. And for this one, they brought in Bill Laswell, who had worked with Mick Jagger and Herbie Hancock, among others. Definitely an interesting choice for a producer. And they took to Master Rock Studios in London to lay down tracks. And it made it to the charts, number 21. On the drums, they brought in Peter Gill, who had played with the Glitter Band, and was also part of the original lineup of Saxon. And right out the gate, Orgasmatron had a completely different sound. Like they were kind of going for more of an epic produced sound. Lemmy, being the centerpiece, still brought that raw and rugged vibe. There are a lot of production tricks on this one. In a lot of ways, it was more polished, but it doesn't sound as bright as some of their earlier work. And it turns out that Lemmy really wasn't a big fan of how this album sounded. Lemmy thought it sounded just really muddy. And another thing was that Laswell was trying to make it hip by sort of merging in some kind of early hip-hop type sounds. But according to Lemmy, it just did not work. Production-wise, it's very dense, very ambitious. But in a lot of ways, it lost the edge of their earlier albums, almost like there was a disconnect because that production provided that extra little sheen that kept the music from being so immediate. But it has some great songs on there. Claw is typical hard-edged motorhead. Fast paced with Lemmy screaming over the top of it, some double bass drum to round it out, and scorching guitars. But in comparison to similar songs, it sounded more thin, as if the bass had been dialed back. Overall, a lot of fans didn't find it to be as satisfying of a listening experience. It came across as an album that tried too hard. So their next album was kind of a return to form in a way. For one, they got Phil, Filthy Animal Taylor, back in the lineup. They had let go of a Pete Gill because really he just wasn't getting along with Lemmy. When the band needed to go somewhere, he would just sit in the hotel lobby reading a paper just making them wait for 20 minutes. And they finally just had enough, so he got the boot and brought Phil back in. They also brought in another producer, Guy Bidmead, at Master Rock Studios in London. And the studio they ended up recording in was owned by Michael Palin of Monty Python fame. And they actually had him come in and do a recitation in the album. So he had showed up in a v-neck sweater with his hair all brushed to the side saying hello what sort of thing are we going to do now then and it turned out to be a standout moment during the recording of the album but motorhead were officially back to the raw raunchy rockin selves one huge standout track is eat the rich which they actually did a music video for and this song was actually written for the film eat the rich where Lemmy made appearances, as well as Bill Wyman and Paul McCartney. And while the film itself didn't really do too well in terms of reviews, it's basically about a waiter in a high-dollar restaurant who's always treated like crap by his customers. He ends up getting canned and forming an anarchist gang, attacking the restaurant. And Motorhead would actually contribute six songs to it, Eat the Rich, Nothing Up My Sleeve, Dr. Rock, the live cut of On the Road, and Orgasmatron. But overall, the sound of rock and roll, the album, is what their earlier work would have sounded like had it have been produced more with state-of-the-art equipment. It's clean sounding, but still as rough around the edges, showing that Motorhead were back. And the dual guitar work was pretty brilliant. Nice layered rhythms and some burning leads. So as the late 80s were tumultuous for the group, they kind of hit the reset button with their next album, 1916 and 1991. So much infighting and lineup changes and the changing world of heavy metal itself made it hard for them to keep going during that time. But this album turned out to be a game changer for the band, showing that Lemmy had not lost his songwriting mojo and they could still grow without losing their edge. Lemmy had moved to LA in 1990, looking to make a big change, and this gave them a new inspiration. So they ended up recording the new album at the Music Grinder Studios in Hollywood, and they brought in Ed Stasium, who had actually worked with the Ramones behind the board. Sound-wise, this album was definitely their heaviest and most cutting edge to date. The guitars were right up front and in your face. The vocals were 
it back in the mix and the drums just sounded epic. And kind of a departure, the song 1916, the title track, was a slower, more somber song about the horrors of World War I. Definitely a huge change from the usual balls to the wall sound. It had cellos and keyboards, but it really showed Lemmy's talent for writing lyrics that were both heartfelt and raw. And the song really struck a chord with a lot of fans who weren't expecting such a tender side for the group. They took an aim at organized religion and no voices in the sky, calling out how it used people's beliefs for power, a theme that he would actually keep coming back to throughout his career. And it really cemented Motorhead's legacy, especially Lemmy's, on the metal scene, because it is such a cohesive album. And at the time, it didn't get a lot of rave reviews, but it is definitely one of the better ones in their catalog, according to many of their fans. No matter what, Lemmy just kept the machine going. Now that label that they had founded, GWR, wasn't on board because they're having legal problems. So they ended up signing to WTG for this album, which is a subsidiary of Epic Records. And the single on this one is The One to Sing the Blues, which is a more cutting and heavy version of Motorhead. Less punk and more metal. The guitar work on this one is intense. Some solid riffs under Lemmy's throaty screaming, the equally intense lead work. Another standout is Going to Brazil, which is basically like a barroom blues song, but just cranked up on steroids. And they also introduced some kind of lighter rock songs, if you will, like Angel City, which is still a hard rocker, but it was a little bit more just like straight rock and roll, which is also a departure from Motorhead as well. The album did really well with critics, even got a nod for the Grammy. So then they followed up with March or Die in 1992. And this one, of course, didn't get quite the rave reviews as the last. But let me show that he could just keep on marching on, even when things are getting rough. Phil Taylor had actually bailed during the recording, so they brought in Tommy Aldred, who played drums with Whitesnake and Ozzy Osbourne, to finish the album. But the band's vibe was kind of messed up with all these sudden lineup changes. A lot of fans thought that the album was missing that raw energy that they had with their older stuff. The production on this one was way smoother than anything Motorhead had done before. They had brought in Peter Solly to actually produce this one, where they managed to keep Lemmy's bass sound really rough, but everything else sounding much more clean and polished. This one features Hellraiser, which was actually co-written with Ozzy Osbourne and Zach Wilde. Who I've covered a couple of videos back. Motorhead's version of the song was used on Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, and this also features Mickey D, a Swedish drummer who would end up joining the band. According to Zach Wilde, since Lemmy was really good friends with Ozzy, back when Randy Rhodes was still in the group, Lemmy and Randy would go out and play the arcade game, so it really just turned out to be a quick phone call. Hey, Let's go ahead and write some songs together. And Hellraiser is one of the standouts from it. And it had much more of a mainstream rock feel to it. Now they were a little out of the punk side and much more into the hard rock metal side of things. It's a nice big anthemic choruses. But what's interesting is by this one, it was obvious that Lemmy was much more in his element singing melodically. And it really showed off his vocal range as well. Lots of cool guitar harmonies throughout. The guitars were just screaming on this one. Absolutely solid lead work. They also did a cover of Ted Nugent's Cat Scratch Fever, putting Lenny's signature on the vocals. Of course, another completely standout collaboration was I Ain't No Nice Guy, which featured both Slash and Ozzy Osbourne. It's a nice, straight-up rock and roll ballad. Kind of has a bit of the 80s power ballad feel. But with Lemmy's rugged vocal, it totally works. The Slash worked his magic for the guitar solo, bringing his signature bluesy licks. And Ozzy's vocal on there was classic Ozzy all the way. I ain't no nice guy after all. And interestingly, Ozzy's and Lemmy's voices really complement each other well on this one. Lyrically, it's Lemmy looking back on things he'd missed out on, and how he was known as a rock and roll rebel, saying he'd given a lot up for his way of life. While the album as a whole didn't do quite as well as their previous album, it still holds a special place in Motorhead's collection. It showed that Lemmy could really keep up with the times and rock, and yet stay true to himself. Then in 1993, Lemmy cranked it right back up again with Bastards. He wanted to make Motorhead heavier again, probably because fans wanted the band to sound raw like they did back in the day. And Lemmy did it. The album was a full-on attack. 
No slow stuff or balance to get in the way. Lemmy's bass got smacked right up center in the mix, distorted and cutting through all the noise. He was still a beast on the bass with songs like Burner and Death or Glory, proving he can lay down some seriously heavy grooves without sacrificing any speed. Phil Cabell and Wurzel's twin guitar attack really stood out on the album. Motorhead's earlier albums sometimes had some pretty melodic guitar parts, but Bastards was all about that raw aggression. Lemmy's growling vocals were front and center, backed by a wall of guitars that just wouldn't let up. Lyrically, it was all about war, fighting back, and just making it through. Burner, one of the heaviest tracks on the album, is a solid anthem about overcoming challenges and living life your own way, which basically mirrored Lemmy's own philosophy about never giving up. It also features a pretty disturbing ballad, Don't Let Daddy Kiss, which was another left curve for Motorhead. It was also a huge departure musically, where he dug deep into the topic of abuse. And even though the song didn't do great on the charts, really because it was just too heavy lyrically, it showed Lemmy wasn't afraid to tackle these tough topics and use his fame at that point to bring attention to more important things. By 95, Motorhead had become a badass heavy rock band again. The Sacrifice was the album that really solidified this. It was a darker, heavier, more brutal album than their previous album. And it reflected a lot of the world of personal stuff that Lemmy had been going through at the time. They recorded Sacrifice at Cherokee Studios in LA, and they brought in Howard Benson to produce. And they wanted the album to sound a bit rougher than their past work. So Lemmy went for a really raw, live feel. He was still using his trusty Reckenbacher plugged into a bunch of Marshall amps. Till Campbell's guitar playing on Sacrifice was seriously heavy, with songs like the title track Sex and Death packing some really crushing riffs and ridiculously fast solos. And that dual guitar attack really came into its own on this one, with Campbell and Wurzel laying down some heavy riffs, really some of the heaviest in their entire discography by that point. Sacrifice overall was a pretty dark album, both musically and lyric. The title track was a harsh look at how pointless war War is, with Lemmy's voice growling over a riff that just keeps going in this effectuous fashion. Songs like Over Your Shoulder and War for War reflected the chaos and destruction that he saw in the world. And the album didn't sell as well as some of the earlier stuff, but the fans still loved it. They're really glad to hear Motorhead just getting back to their heavy selves. And as the new millennium rolled in, Lemmy did not slow down. With We Are Motorhead coming out in 2000, he was all about loud, fast, and aggressive music. They recorded the album at Maple Studios in Santa Ana, California, with Bob Kulik producing. And they whipped this album up in a hurt, showing they didn't mess around when it came to making music. Of course, Lemmy was never really into studio gimmicks or endless overdubs. He just wanted to capture the raw energy of the live shows as realistically as possible. Lemmy's bass dominated the sound, cutting through the mix like a buzzsaw. The album is rough and intense, the tracks like See Me Burning, Stay Out of Jail, showcasing some of Motorhead's heaviest riffs ever. Lyrics about rebellion and telling the powers that be to shove it. The title track was a rebellious anthem that said, screw the rules, and embrace the band's refusal to follow trends or meet anybody's expectations. Lemmy's lyrics were always blunt, with lines like, we don't need to be like you because we are Motorhead and we don't care. That summed up the whole band's vibe. The album also included a cover of Sex Pistols' God Save the Queen, which made sense considering Lemmy's punk-influenced take on rock. In his late 60s, Lemmy was starting to have some health problems that started in 2015, likely from years of living fast. He had actually gotten diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in 2013, and they put a defibrillator in his chest because of his heart. Nevertheless, Lemmy kept on trucking, touring, and recording. <laughs> Motorhead's final studio album, Bad Magic, hit the shelves in August of 2015, and it was their 22nd album. They had tracked it at NRG Studios in LA with Cameron Webb producing. And by this time, Lenny was sick as they were recording, but he was still dead set on making an album that sounded like pure Motorhead. Wemmy's bass playing on Bad Magic was still super aggressive, even though he said that his health was actually making things tougher. Tracks like Thunder and Lightning and Electricity on the album still had that crazy, relentless energy that Motorhead was known for. Lyrically, Lemmy was exploring death and what we leave behind with a song like Till the End, serving as a powerful look at his life. 
critics and fans alike loved the album, and ultimately they agreed that Motorhead had ended things on a strong note, delivering one of their best albums in years. On December 28, 2015, Lemmy passed away just a few days after turning 70. Earlier that week, he had been diagnosed with prostate cancer. He was also going through heart failure as well as diabetes, and his death really marked the end of an era in rock and roll. Fans and other musicians were devastated. They had a memorial service for him at the Rainbow Bar and Grill in L.A., and it was a star-studded affair with Metallica, Slash, Dave Grohl, among rock legends who showed up to pay their respects. It was streamed live all over so fans could say their goodbyes as well. Lemmy's rock and roll rebelliousness is something that people will always remember about. His tunes keep inspiring young up-and-comers, and he always lived life his own way, which is still a big deal for people who care about being real in a world that these days is all about looks and money. Lemmy's biggest thing wasn't just the music, but the life he lived. All about defying expectations, loving what he did, and staying true to rock and roll. Something really weird, I just found out the most expensive guitar on Amazon is a signature guitar, and you won't believe whose signature guitar it is. I left the link below in the description. And to my subscribers, I really want to thank you so much for all the inspiration and feedback. I truly do appreciate it. And if you haven't had a chance to subscribe to this channel, make sure you smack that subscribe button. And while you're at it, hit the like button. Join the family and want to thank you so much for watching.